Today we're going to look at the foundations of our faith. And firstly, the firm basis for our faith is Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled many of the Old Testament prophecies at his first coming, and the rest have been written into modern history and will be completed in the end times, along with the further prophecies in the New Testament, and especially in the book of Revelation. Modern history will be completed in the end times when he returns as he promised. One of the promises he gave, which I have recently looked at with new eyes is this. I will come again and receive you to myself. This means that we're going to be united with the risen Christ, not just the risen Christ, but the glorified Christ. God has repeatedly said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so he said, when he returned to heaven, he asked his Father to send the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and kept that promise and more. When he gave us this promise, he said, I will give you another comforter. And the word another is another of the same sort. a comforter and inspirer. I don't know whether you've come across this word comforter before or whether you think what it means. But um, one very interesting statement was made a few years ago um, about the Bayeux Tapestry. And on the Bayeux Tapestry, William the Conqueror is urging his troops forward. How was he doing it? He was poking them in the back with a spear. <laughs> and so we must be prepared to be comforted as we approach the time of his return. Talking about the foundation of our faith, I want us to look at laying the foundation first of all. The building, every building has a foundation. Well, we hope they have. This has got a good foundation. But there are quite a lot of buildings which um, perhaps um, don't have quite as good foundation. One of them is the Tower of Pisa, which is leaning a little more all the time. And a lot of people have said, well, when is it going to fall? Nobody seems to know. And now they're, they're very worried and they're trying to prop it up in some way, but they can't prop it up outside, they've got to do something with the foundation and it's very difficult to change the foundation of a building which is wrong. My uh, teaching hospital had um, two wings which were built in the um, 17th century, uh, no 18th century early years yes. and um, in the 18th century the foundations were made with great big bulks of timber. The result of that is that um, a few years ago, after I left the hospital to practice medicine, the, one of the wings started to sink. And they had to pay a lot of money to replace the foundation, and they had to replace the foundation in little bits so that the rest of the structure didn't fall. So that shows how important foundations are. 
And I want to just uh, have a look at one or two pictures. We'll sing this one first. Oh no, we'll sing it after, that's good. There's one. Now as you can see it's well and truly solid foundation. It's rock. Let's have the next one please. There's another one. Now this is Edinburgh Castle and you see all this rock here castle has been there for a long long time now and it's solid. absolutely solid so now the third one please now you'd think well a bit dodgy this one but it's not it's got a very good foundation and it's going to be there enjoying the tourist visits for many years to come I expect but this is not what always happens and I just want you to have a look at this video and see what happens if you don't lay the right foundation. Now the problem is that that last property was not built on rock, it was built on sand. And the Bible tells us about that very strongly. Um, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 4 to 29, which we'll put on the screen now please, Here it comes. It's the wise and the foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat about that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Let's just cement this or concrete this in. We're going to sing a song. I hope. No, not that one. No, that's the wrong song. The rock that ever stands. Who oh, build on the rock, not upon the sands. Fear the storm or the earthquake shock. You're safe forever. Oh, 
You'll save forevermore if you build on the rock. I'd like to, I'd like to thank Steve for um, very kindly processing all these songs. They're fantastically done. Thank you, Steve. Now, St. Paul knew the importance of laying a foundation for others to build on it. And this is where the spiritual foundation comes in very importantly. In our second reading, he explains that this foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we take great note of this because it does affect us in 2021 just as it, might, it did all those years ago. So, if you put that reading up, please. That's, no, next one, please. That's the one. He says this, By the grace of God given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, <coughs> and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now this next bit is very concerning because it looks at the various materials that can be used in that foundation, on that foundation. And the important thing is that these different materials are applicable to the church because the church has the task of bringing the news of the gospel of Christ to a needy world. And the way that is done is looked at by St. Paul as materials of gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay or straw. So each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, and that's the day when Jesus interviews everyone about what they've done in their Christian lives. The day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. Now why fire? Because fire is um, the way in which we test whether it's something that comes to bits like hay and stubble or whether it endures forever like gold and silver or actually costly stones, what happens is that fire will show the quality of that work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. 
even through only as one escaping through the flames. It's quite a warning really for Christians to be master builders of the kingdom and using the right materials at the right time. And after this, immediately after this, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you are together that temple. So human beings are together God's temple and each one of us bears the likeness, spirit likeness of our Father God and Jesus. Now I was muttering in my mind about this and the Lord said, well you must mention it. One thing is sinful habits which destroy our spiritual body. And of course, this is not very popular today, abortion destroys the humanity of our physical bodies. And it needs to be very carefully thought through as to what we are going to do about these things. There's one verse which I want you to keep very much in your mind and that is verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 3 and that is for no other foundation can anyone lay than is laid which is Jesus Christ and that means that Anyone who tries to bring a different gospel or even a, dis a different system of worship is adulterating that foundation. And it's very easy today to see that happening a lot in our world and even in the church, especially the churches which are looking for the wrong way of uniting. So Jesus is the foundation of our faith. What is the origin of our faith? Where did it come from? And the answer is that the Bible record of the history of the Lord Jesus in God's plan of salvation, remember that the Bible is actually the whole picture of how the Lord has made provision for our salvation. One verse says, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was no accident. The crucifixion was planned. When God decided to make man, he knew that there was a possibility that we've giving him free will, he might choose the wrong thing. In fact, he was pretty certain that he would choose the wrong thing. So Jesus was prepared to come 
and be crucified right from the foundation of the world. No accident. Then there was the testimony of those who were with him in Israel. Um, the, obviously, the apostles were one lot, but in Acts it says that at one point, I think it was um, Paul before King Herod, I think, but I'm not sure about that, 500 brethren in Galilee after the resurrection saw the, re the resurrected Christ complete with the scars of the nails and the spear. And then there were those who had a personal contact. One in particular, obviously, is St. Paul on the Damascus Road. And then there's the evidence of changed lives. One of the most obvious here is John Newton, who wrote that lovely hymn. He was a former slave trader and captain of a, a slave boat. And then more from the beginning, I think, there was an event where Paul and Silas were incarcerated in a prison because they had cast out a demon. And they were in this prison and they sang praises, sing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. And then there was an earthquake. And the foundations of the prison were changed, uh, shaken. And all at once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped and he'd been given very, very strict instructions by the magistrates to keep them safe, and he put them in the inner prison. Now look what happened, what the jailer did. First of all, the jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord. And you see, right in the middle of all this, they were prepared to speak the gospel, the good news about Jesus. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. Now this is the punchline. What did he do? The jailer, although it was in the night, took them out and washed their wounds. Immediately he and all his household were baptized. That's interesting because they didn't have a, a baptism course beforehand. But St. Paul was certain that they had received the Lord Jesus. 
And the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had become to believe in God, he and his whole household. You see, he did something practical, not just changed his beliefs. And so I want to look again at building that foundation of our faith in Jesus as Son of God and Saviour. And if you want to look at that fairly carefully, and remembering that there are more than one statements about what happens when you become a Christian. But I found that James and his epistle give us a very important area to look at. And I'd like you to put that up, please. It's James chapter 2 and verse 14 onwards. Faith and deeds. That's what the Philippian jailer showed. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, get back into bed. Oh no, it doesn't say that. Um, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith? I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. See, there's a mistake in the way in which those two people are looking at change brought about by faith in the Lord Jesus. And he even backs that up by saying, you believe there's one God. Both of them do. Hmm? Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous but what they do and not by faith alone. And then there was Rahab, the prostitute. She was considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, you will see that faith is in action again. And both together complete our salvation. And if you look at Romans 10, chapters nine, um, verses 9 and 10, it says, Confess with your mouth 
that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So I think this is a real challenge to us as Christians that we need to show the world that our faith is real and doing things to help others at the same time as our belief and telling people about our belief or making provision for it is the way forward. But not just the way forward, it is something that is so important that it needs to be considered very carefully all the time. So just let's have a prayer now. Father, we thank you for what your word tells us about doing our work on the right foundation. We thank you, Lord, that you have given people in this church the gift of being able to follow your instructions and not just make decisions which are their own ideas. And we thank you especially that we've seen your stamp of authority on the lighthouse by the way you've made provision financially for that lighthouse project to be completed in short order. And so we bless and praise your holy name that you are really alive and with us by your Holy Spirit until that day when you return in power and glory. We thank you for your love which draws us to yourself. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.